Like Lincoln said, if America is ever destroyed, it will come from within. All is fair in love and war, and the defeat of the opposition will also come from within. Not all those who sold their souls to join the secret organizations want to stay there. The glittering fool's gold brings no fulfillment. Some are willing to lose everything to come clean and join the light. So stay tuned for this gruesome affair, stalked by shadows, a targeted individual's journey to overcome. Finding yourself in the talons of an owl and the shadows of the forest moonlight. It's a gruesome affair. I never thought that my life would take such a dark turn. Back in 2016, I was working as a lawyer, respected in my field, and on track to becoming a partner at my firm. Things were on the up. I loved my job and felt like I was making a difference in the world. But then things started to change. Just when I started to realize that my dreams were coming true, all of that just changed when I became the target of a secret organization's harassment campaign. The dark era of my life affected my mental and physical health terribly. Pins and needles, tight throat, headaches, At first, it started with minor and strange occurrences that I initially dismissed as coincidences. It was just a feeling that something wasn't quite right. I would notice strange cars parked outside my apartment and feel like someone was following me. A car that seemed to be following me on my commute to work and a strange man in a hoodie that I kept seeing on my morning jog. But I brushed it off, thinking that I was just being paranoid. But soon, it became clear that these were no coincidences. I would notice people following me on the street or staring at me in public places. It started happening consistently, and I began to feel paranoid. On top of that, I began receiving these phone calls late at night. The voice on the other end was always distorted, making it impossible to identify the caller. They would whisper taunts and threats, always making it clear that they were watching my every move. One night, the caller said, Have a nice life, in this cheesy, Skeletor-like voice. It wasn't just the phone calls. I would find strange objects in my home, as though someone had been inside while I was out. My computer would glitch and freeze at odd times and I received strange emails from unknown addresses. The harassment wasn't just limited to me either. The organization had somehow convinced my colleagues and friends to turn against me. They would avoid me, and some even went as far as to spread false rumors about me. It was like a never-ending game of cat and mouse. I would try to catch a glimpse of the people following me, but they were always one step ahead. It was as though they knew my every move before I even made one. It was also overwhelming, and I began to doubt my own sanity. I felt like my life was filled with fear and paranoia, unable to trust anyone or anything. But the most unnerving part of it all was the feeling of being watched. I would feel eyes on me everywhere I went, in the office, on the street, and even in my own home. You know that feeling when your scalp and neck tickle because you know someone is looking at you? Yeah. It was like there was always someone lurking just out of sight. I began to feel like I was going crazy. I would hear phantom footsteps behind me and feel as though I was being followed even when no one was there. My anxiety was through the roof, and I started to become paranoid about everyone around me. When things became difficult for me to handle alone, I tried to tell my friends and family about what was happening, but they didn't believe me. They told me that I was imagining things and needed to take a break from work, but I knew I wasn't crazy. I knew that something was happening, and I couldn't ignore it. One day, In the morning, 
when I woke up to get ready for work, I saw that I had received a package in the mail. And that was the moment when I realized the true extent of what was happening. Inside was a folder full of pictures of me, taken from all different angles and at different times. There were notes scrawled on them detailing my movements and activities. A shiver ran down my spine. These people had been watching me for months, maybe even years. They seemed to know everything about me, and I had no idea who they were. I immediately went to the police, but they didn't take me seriously. They brushed me off, saying that it was likely just a prank or a case of mistaken identity. But I knew in my gut that this was something more. I became obsessed with figuring out who was behind the harassment. I spent every free moment poring over the pictures and notes, trying to find some clue that would lead me to them. But it was like searching for a needle in a haystack. Several days passed with anxiety and paranoia, and then I decided to go out for some activity to clear my mind. I went to the office where my colleagues were talking about attending the protest, hoping to bring attention to the issues of police brutality. I don't want to say specifically what the protest was or write any keywords here. I want to tell my story but keep it anonymous. I immediately joined my colleagues and headed towards the protest site. The decision to attend the protest against police brutality turned out very well for me as I met Sarah there. She was standing beside me. As we both chanted and held our signs high, I noticed her taking pictures of the event. Something about her caught my attention, and I struck up a conversation with her. As we talked, I found myself opening up to her about the strange experiences I had been going through. To my surprise, she was sympathetic and genuinely interested in helping me. But she was busy at that moment and had to go somewhere, so we exchanged contact information and decided to meet up to discuss my situation further. Over the next few weeks, Sarah and I met up several times to discuss my experiences and brainstorm ways to gather evidence against the organization that seemed to be targeting me. Her expertise as a journalist proved invaluable. When I say journalist, I specifically mean independent journalist, like the Japanese one that tried to get answers from the recent Davos meeting. When the journalist is not on the payroll of the mainstream media, they are free to do actual journalism. Remember, like Henry Kissinger said, the definition of the word legitimate is not the truth. Legitimate is what they say it is. Mental note, if they say it's legitimate, it probably is not the truth. Sarah told me too many stunning things about the secret organization. I was initially skeptical, but the more she spoke, the more I realized that she was telling the truth. Her words seemed to make sense. Her mental connect the dots added up and matched my intuition and experience. After hearing about the harassing incidents that I had encountered, Sarah told me that there was a secret and shadowy organization working to silence anyone who posed a threat to their agenda. And the agenda is very big. She said that they had been watching me for years and that I was in grave danger. As an independent journalist, Sarah also did some research on this secret organization and told me that the harassment tactics used by the organization were specifically designed to make me feel as though I was constantly being watched and followed. It is one of the kinds of psychological torture that wore down my mental state over time. The organization was a highly structured and disciplined group with a clear hierarchy of power. They were skilled at using psychological tactics to control their members, including fear, intimidation, and manipulation. After hearing this, I realized the extent 
of their tactics. They had been using a combination of surveillance and psychological manipulation to make me feel isolated and alone, but I didn't know what to do. I felt like I was in over my head, like a pawn in a much larger chess game, but I was aware of the fact that I couldn't just sit back and let this happen to me. A few days passed, and I noticed the day I started meeting up with Sarah, the harassment and stalking incidents intensified. I felt like I was being watched every time I left my home. I would catch glimpses of the same people following me no matter where I went, but this time I was not going to be scared of them. So one night at around 1 a.m., I went for a short walk and decided to follow one of the people who had been following me. I saw a man dressed in formal black clothes, and he was constantly following me. I knew it was risky, but I was desperate to know the truth. After some time, I stopped for a while, and I started following him through the dark streets, but the man disappeared in one of those narrow streets in the neighborhood. The next day, I called Sarah again and told her about the man that I had followed through the narrow streets. She told me to meet her at a nearby cafe where she told me that there was a way to fight back. The organization relies on secrecy, trauma-based mind control, and fear to control its targets. If we could figure out a way to expose their tactics to the world, we could neutralize their power. At first, I was hesitant as I didn't want to put myself in more danger by going public with my story but Sarah assured me that we would be working together and that she had a plan to keep me safe. We started by reaching out to independent journalists and other groups with our story. At first, we were met with skepticism and disbelief, but the more we dug, the more we uncovered. Some understood completely and that we were exactly on the same page and they knew what was going on. We found other targets of this organization, people who had been living in fear for years but were too afraid to speak out. They had been shamed. They had been called crazy, paranoid, or schizophrenic. The shame worked and many were silenced, at least for a while. I realized that their hold on people was stronger than I had feared. I knew that I needed solid evidence and information to bring them down, but I was starting to feel like finding it was an impossible task. Together we built a case against the organization, gathering evidence and testimonies from many targeted individuals. It was a long and grueling process. The only problem that we were facing was that we did not have enough evidence against the organization to prove them guilty of their crimes. But I was satisfied and ambitious because we were making progress day by day. And beyond that, if one does speak out, they can become a target of an even more aggressive smear campaign. Sarah and I were determined and worked tirelessly through the long COVID winter day and night, piecing together every scrap of information we could find. And then, one day, we stumbled upon something that changed everything. It was Sunday, my office was closed, and I was in a deep state of sleep because I had stayed up too late the night before, but a phone call interrupted my sleep. I got out of my bed, picked up my phone, and rushed toward my window in paranoia. It became normal for me because, after being stalked several times, I adapted myself to live in a constant state of alertness. I answered the call and kept staring out of my window, and two cars were parked at my drive through I heard a middle-aged man's voice on the other end who told me that they had been watching me, and they knew what I was planning. He told me to check outside my apartment's front door, and he said he would contact me soon, soon being any time and any day. When I was about to ask him his name, 
he hung up the call, and one car parked at my drive through sped off down the street. Nobody drives like that unless they want you to notice them. It was too obvious. I was terrified and knew these people were dangerous, and I had no idea what they could do. Still, I showed courage and immediately went out to check my front door. I was surprised to see that there was a computer hard drive. I picked up the hard drive and found a sticky note attached to it that simply read, this will help you. I was hesitant to open it, but my curiosity got the best of me. I knew gang stalkers use USB drives to infiltrate closed networks, but I took the risk. I connected the drive. When I plugged it into my laptop, I found that it was full of files and documents related to the organization. Some call it the Cabal. Some call it the Satanic Mafia cult. It was a goldmine of information, and I couldn't believe my luck. I quickly realized that the hard drive had come from someone inside the organization. But who could it be? And why were they helping me? I called Sarah and told her everything. And after a few minutes, she arrived at my house. She was also surprised to see the information we got on the hard drive. And we decided to use the hard drive to gather even more evidence. We had to be careful though. We knew that the organization was watching us. Who knows what the consequences would be if they knew how much information we have on them. We spent long nights poring over the files, piecing together every detail we could find. We learned the names of the key members, the locations of their meetings, and the tactics they used to intimidate and silence their victims. I'll just say this, it is nasty and vicious and not something I want to write down or say here. During the course of our investigation, we realized that the hard drive had been given to us by someone very high up in the pyramid of the organization. We didn't know who it was specifically, but we knew that we needed to find them and convince them to help us take down the organization from the inside. Fortunately, after waiting for four days, I received a phone call from the same number, and the member told me to meet him at a mall within 30 minutes, as he had something very important to tell me. I told Sarah about it and arrived at the meeting place and waited for my contact to arrive. I was a bundle of nerves. I exercised deep belly breathing to keep myself calm. I knew this was a dangerous thing I was about to do, but I was determined to bring the organization to its knees. When the member arrived, I was shocked to see who it was. It was someone I had never expected, someone I had trusted for years. His name was David, and he was a successful entrepreneur and businessman in our area. I had always known him as a kind-hearted and intelligent man, always willing to help. I didn't want to believe it. I had always trusted David, and the idea that he could be involved in something so nefarious was hard to accept. As we sat down to talk, I could feel my heart racing. My mind stopped working and I forgot what to say or how to approach the subject of the organization. But as we spoke, I began to sense that David knew more than he was letting on. He told me that he had gotten involved with the organization years ago when he was going through a hard time during the past years of his life. They had promised him power and influence. He had been foolish enough to believe them. As he became more involved, he realized that the organization was not what he thought it was. They used fear and intimidation to control their members and didn't care who they hurt in the process. They corrupt people and then use the corruption they created 
against the people they corrupted. David was trapped and didn't know how to get out. But when he heard about our plan, he saw a glimmer of hope. He realized that together, we might just be able to bring the organization down. It was a risky move for both of us, but we agreed to work together. They had stuff on him, and slandering and destroying David's reputation would be their first counter move against us. After some time, Sarah arrived and started questioning him about the organization's tactics. She wanted to add them to our story, and David gave us essential secrets of the organization's tactics. He told us about the use of handlers, individuals assigned to monitor and control specific members. These handlers would keep tabs on their assigned members every move. The organization also had a sophisticated communication system with encrypted messaging and code words to keep their activities secret. They were able to coordinate complex operations across multiple locations, often using false identities and dummy corporations to hide their tracks. I have files with lists of their symbols, and they are literally everywhere once you have eyes to see them. Their power was largely based on their ability to maintain secrecy and anonymity. They increased their power and control with incrementalism under the veil of humanity or progress. They had connections throughout the government and private sectors, and especially so-called non-government organizations. Members of the organizations were subjected to strict rules and harsh punishments for any infractions. They were taught to view the outside world with suspicion and paranoia, and were warned that anyone who posed a threat to the organization must be eliminated, either in reputation or physically. One of the most sinister tactics of the organization was their use of gaslighting. This is a form of psychological manipulation in which the target is made to doubt their own perceptions and sanity. The organization would use gaslighting to convince members that they were being watched or followed, even when they weren't. This would create a sense of paranoia and fear, making the members more susceptible to the organization's control. The organization also had a sophisticated system for gathering information on potential targets. They would use online tools and social media to gather information on individuals, looking for any vulnerabilities or weaknesses that they could exploit. Another tactic of the organization was its use of street theater. This involved staging fake situations in public to make the target feel like they are being watched or followed. For example, they might have actors pretend to be arguing or fighting near the target, or have someone drop a briefcase or a bag near them and then walk away. They might have someone say, Hey, you know Elvis is in town this week? Sure, and I hear Bigfoot is doing the warm-up. These staged situations would create a sense of unease and paranoia in the target. After hearing this, Sarah and I knew what our next step would be. We knew that the organization's methods effectively controlled its members and maintained their secrecy. However, their reliance on secrecy would also be their downfall, as it allowed us to slowly gather evidence and build a case against them. Also, the symbolism will also be a part of their downfall. All the secret symbols that show allegiance also reveal the crime. By shining a light on their activities and tactics and bringing them to the public's attention, we were able to at least direct away some of their power and restore some sense of justice and hope for the honest community. David gave us the names of some high-ranked and key members involved in our area's organization, including the local leadership. 
You may have heard of some of the names. He said he would turn himself in and help us bring them down. He was willing to lose it all if that's what it would take. We agreed and took our evidence to the people working for the authorities that we trust. And with their help, we were able to make a strategy to attempt to dismantle the organization. It won't be easy, and we have to constantly watch our backs to ensure our safety. But in the end, justice will be served. It's just a matter of time. Looking back on everything that had happened, I feel a sense of relief now and a renewed sense of hope. It makes one realize that they must trust their own intuition and consult their own discernment. The organization's harassment had been a dark cloud that had hung over my life for far too long, and I was glad to finally feel free from its grip. Although the experience was very difficult, it has taught me a valuable lesson. I learned that no matter how hopeless things may seem, a way forward is always available, and you just need to find it. It takes faith. If you think you can persevere, you most likely can. It's a question of will. If you give up, at that moment you lost. But you want to win, so you fight every day. The enemy definitely fights every day and wants you fat, depressed, and distracted. No to that. I also discovered the strength and resilience that I possess, and I feel empowered by the knowledge that I can overcome any obstacle that comes my way. As I look toward the future, I feel a sense of excitement and possibility. With the organization's power greatly diminished spiritually, their methods exposed in plain view for those with eyes to see, people are able to choose whether to be distracted or focused if they have the will to. I know there will be tough challenges ahead and I'm confident that strength and support to face these challenges will be there. Although the scars of the past may never fully heal, I am grateful for the dark days. Pressure makes diamonds. Darkness accentuates light. It taught me the importance of standing up for oneself and the power of resilience and hope. As things move forward, I am determined to apply these tough and bitter lessons and to resist evil as it presents itself and see the cheap theater, deceit, and trickery for and what it is. The cheap theater, deceit, and trickery for and what it is. Theater, deceit, and trickery for what it is. It's been awesome having you visit for this horrible tale. Dusk is a time of transition. It's an owl's wake-up call. As the shadows grow longer and darkness takes over, the only thing to fear is fear itself. You can also catch Smoking Owl Tales on TikTok, Instagram, as well as podcasts, including Anchor, Spotify, and Apple. We have big plans for 2023. There are several mind-blowing collaboration stories in the works right now. If you feel the call, give a rip at the subscribe button and scratch at the comments. Stay longer now or catch you on another night very soon because the story goes on and on and on and on. And on.